Well, thank you very much, uh, everybody, and um, good evening. And uh, it was interesting, Richard, to hear, uh, to be reminded about Ian's role, because um, obviously I think most of us in this room knew him. Even, he, wasn't, he wasn't a very um, exuberant man. He was a quiet man, a modest man. And so some of what he'd done throughout his life didn't actually uh, come through to everybody, I believe. So it was very interesting to hear, uh, to hear that. So, you know, I have to recognise my bad luck in actually having to give this lecture on this subject now, at this moment, when our state, because don't forget we're talking about cooperatives and the state, where are we now, when our state is facing its most chaotic, volatile, divisive and uncertain future uh, for decades. So what I'm going to talk to you about tonight is my view. And I want to try and break down my talk into three sections, really. Uh, where we are now in the United Kingdom, and I come to that from my experience uh, in British politics and in European politics. Although I know a lot of faces in the room, there are some that I don't. And for those, uh, can I say that um, um, I've been in the cooperative movement now for 35 years. Uh, I worked firstly in the cooperative movement. Uh, well, I came into it looking for a non-military and non-religious organisation for my children to join. And I found the Woodcraft folk. Uh, I became a leader of the Woodcraft folk for a short time uh, in High Barnet, and, uh, and, and I joined the cooperative movement at that point. I joined a cooperative society um, and became interested. Um, um, you, you'll understand a little bit later how I, I came to, to know about the cooperative movement. But um, So as, as I went forward in my life, um, I want to try and talk firstly about my political life, then about my cooperative life and what I've learnt when uh, I was Chief Executive of Cooperatives UK, then um, at the same time co-president of Cooperatives Europe, and then of course when I left to become president of the International Cooperative Alliance, I worked very closely uh, at all the senior levels with global institutions, the World Bank, the IMF, the United Nations, the G20 and so on. So I want to talk a bit about that and how all that has, has meshed together in now um, for me to, to give you some ideas about what I think we can do now as a cooperative movement to try and deal with some of the issues that we are facing in the United Kingdom today. So that's what I'm going to try and do. Um, so I can't, I didn't believe that I could come here and talk to you about this issue today without first and foremost talking and putting on record my own view and my, my, uh, my sense uh, of the issues of the moment. And I guess a lot of you in the room who know me um, will know from my career or from what I've been saying uh, in the recent or writing recently that I, of course, voted to remain in the United King in the, in the United Kingdom in the European <laughs> Union. I'm not so keen on that. My children are going to Canada. They're thinking about going to Canada now. Um, that I voted for the Remain side in last week's referendum, and I didn't do that despite my. Uh, history. I didn't do that because I'm some sort of fanatical supporter of a Euro European superstate. In fact, during my 10 years in the European Parliament, I always positioned myself as a pragmatic European, i.e. I believed very, very strongly and still do now in working together for the common good. And as a cooperator, it would be very strange if I didn't. Let me be completely frank, there was, and I'm sure probably still is, uh, a federalist tendency running through European institutions, European politics, European parties. When I was in the European Parliament, which, and I left of course at the, uh, at the beginning of 2000 to go to Cooperatives UK, but when I was there, uh, the 10 years I was there, five years as leader of the largest group in the Parliament, the European as it was then, the European Socialist Group, I was a Labour and Cooperative member of the European Parliament. Uh, but there was a very clear tendency, federalist tendency, largely coming from some of the founder members, uh, from the French, uh, from the Germans, uh, Luxembourg, uh, those sort of countries that were, did produce a strong tendency to be more and more federalist. 
those countries, in all fairness, who had always suffered, particularly during the 20th century, with, uh, with wars across their borders and all the destruction that brought. So uh, uh, you could understand it on that front. But also in the European Commission, there was a tendency from people being recruited to work there uh, for a, a federalist tendency running through that. I believe very strongly in the role of a member of parliament as a democratic representative of the people that elected them. And I loved the period when we had constituencies. And my constituency was North London, the London boroughs of Barnet, Enfield and Haringey. And I loved to be able to say that I represented the area in London where my family lived and where my father was born. And my grandfather was a bus conductor out of Wood Green bus station, and it's still there. Um, I think it's still there today, Wood Green bus station. It certainly was about 10 years ago. Um, so, uh, so for me, uh, that represented something very personal, and, and, and I loved that period when you could actually feel you had people there whose MEP you were. And I think when we moved to a, a proportional representation and the list system, we lost that connection, and, and things have, without any question, deteriorated in terms of public perception uh, since then. It was never good, and people did not vote uh, in huge numbers for the European Parliament, and one of the issues for me was always that national governments, not just ours, whichever it was, Tory or Labour, but national governments always use uh, the European elections as a test of the government in power nationally. It wasn't largely on European issues. It was about whether you want the Tories to stay in and this is our chance to give them a kicking. Well, we've just seen the effect of that uh, in last week, Lib week's uh, referendum uh, to some extent. But uh, it always seemed to me that, that there, and I always argued, that we were missing the essential trick of actually selling what Europe could give to, uh, to the people of this country. So as a Democrat, I always recognised that greater unity in Europe depended on the democratic will of the peoples of Europe. And that, was a, and that there was a very long way to go before that was secured, generations to go probably, before that was secured. Hence my identification of myself as a pragmatic European. Because, you see, I wasn't ever frightened of the concept of a united Europe. It never scared me. But I was clear that it was generations away at that time. And I think it's important to explain that as it impacts on my view of the nation state. For me, as a soldier's daughter, and I lived in Malta, Egypt and Germany during my childhood in the immediate post-war years, I came to the conclusion at a very young age that peace was, a pri a, a, that was to be prized above all else. And this was deeply ingrained in me, uh, in my psyche, having been evacuated under military protection uh, from Egypt during the Suez Crisis, uh, firstly, from the village we lived in in Egypt, from the apartment we had in, a, in an Arab village, uh, to a, a tented community uh, so protected by the British Army, and then being taken out uh, under fire um, uh, during the Suez Crisis. And then having been in a very tense Germany during the 1956 Hungarian uprising, when Soviet tanks moved to the East German border, and the British Army of the Rhine, as it was called then, and my father was a soldier in the British Army of the Rhine, uh, was on high alert as war seemed inevitable. And I remember this because I remember that one year in November, a bonfire night, bonfire night, which was always great on army, army, army camps for children. We couldn't have any fireworks, we couldn't have any bonfires, because uh, there was a, a real pre-war alert going on at that moment. So all of these things impacted on my psyche as a child. So I've been temperamentally inclined ever since, and, and as I grew up, uh, to the European project, given the underpinning concept of the founders of the EU was to bind European nation states together economically so they never could go to war again because they would lose more than just lives. They would lose livelihoods, they would lose economies and so forth. During my years in the European Parliament, I had the very great privilege to work with somebody that some of you may well remember, uh, John Hume, who was the leader of the Social Democratic and Labour Party in Northern Ireland. And when the Good Friday Agreement for Northern Ireland was announced, um, I was working with Mo Molam, the then Northern Ireland Secretary, um, to try and persuade the European 
uh, Union to the European Community as it was then to try and support the Good Friday peace process. And I negotiated uh, with the European Commission uh, a 70 million fund for cross-community projects in Northern Ireland as the very first part of the peace dividend. Uh, and when Mo Molan came to the European Parliament to announce the terms of the Good Friday Agreement, she was able to make that announcement of the first uh, peace dividend for uh, Northern Ireland. And I had, um, the, uh, as, as the leader of the socialist group, I was the first one to speak in the parliament. And I ceded that right to speak first to John Hume. John Hume, uh, who was a member of uh, uh, the socialist group in the European parliament, he was a very uh, calm, quietly spoken man, John, very powerful orator. Uh, and uh, as he was speaking about uh, the way in which um, his... his uh, people had suffered in Northern Ireland and, and of course John was the person who first brought together uh, the British government and the, and the IRA to talk uh, and he was vilified for that for a long time and, and has suffered very badly as did his family. Uh, but John was very grateful to the EU uh, and he said, and I remembered this and I've remembered it ever since, what the words he used, the European Union is the most successful ever initiative for conflict re resolution that the world has ever seen. And that stuck in my mind as a very powerful reiteration of what I believed was the underpinning uh, of the EU. And I had the huge honor to nominate John for the Nobel Peace Prize, which he went on then uh, to win together with David Trimble for um, the, the, the uh, peace in Northern Ireland. Um, Another thing that John said during that speech, to the heckling of the Reverend Ian Paisley, who sat with the non-aligned members and fascists and others at the back screaming across the chamber, um, but John, in his calm uh, uh, and confident way, said, it's time that we shared our sweat rather than spilled our blood to build uh, a life together. And all of these words and, uh, really resonated with me and reinforced the value of the European project. Uh, and, and certainly as a mother, it, it was important to me, and that became even more important when I became a grandmother. I simply would rather that we sent our ministers to Brussels to talk and talk and talk again to secure a consensus rather than we end up sending our sons and grandsons to fight, as my father did and my grandfather did before me. So is that idealistic fluff, as I'm told by some it is? Uh, well, is it? Who amongst us can forget the horror, fairly recently, of neighbour murdering neighbour in the former Yugoslavia? And I was leader of the socialist group when a man, a Frenchman called Bernard Kouchner, who was a founder member of Médecins Sans Frontières, rushed into the socialist group, which was in, se in session, shouting, they are murdering Muslim men in Srebrenica. At this moment, they are murdering thousands of men and boys. Uh, and, of course, we know now, so sadly, that that was true. How can we forget the Middle East conflicts that have followed the Arab Spring, which was a moment, a very short moment as it was, uh, of hope that there were going to be democrat democracies established uh, and the people of the Middle East would get um, their democratic freedoms? Or the Chechen or Georgian conflicts, or the standoff with Russia over both uh, the Crimea and eastern Ukraine, or more recently, of course, in Syria. And all of these are in our backyards, all of them. None of them are far from us. The generational memory of the public is short, or perhaps I'm just getting old, actually. But it troubles me that the EU's role in preserving and building peaceful coexistence isn't valued more. And that concern has grown as, like me, I'm sure, you have been horrified at the growing attacks on minority communities uh, in the UK since last week's vote. It's horribly evocative of Europe's not-so-distant history. But it's happening here, in our streets. And that's what's so shocking. So I'm a strongly convinced supporter of the European Union, flawed as it is, and imperfect as it is, uh, and, you know, I was, I was there during probably the time when uh, the European Parliament was gaining more powers than it has uh, ever since uh, or, or before gained. I was there and I was instrumental in the sacking of the European Commission 
Apparently, we have no democratic rights in Europe, but the European Parliament is able and did sack the European Commission in the beginning of 1999. When I was leading the Socialist Group, uh, and we took the decision to vote against the European Commission, and it was a socialist-led commission. But when we, we decided to vote against it, and I instructed my uh, assistant to go and phone the Commission President's office and tell him the socialist group would be against, and 20 minutes later, the whole commission resigned. So, you know, it can be done. Democracy has been played out in the European Union. Um, but it is flawed, and there's much more that can be done. So I am a strongly convinced supporter of the union, but looking at it uh, with, without rose-tinted glasses, seriously, is Westminster any better? The political debacle of the, the last few days is frankly almost too painful to bear for those of us who've been involved in British politics. And I believe that history will judge David Cameron harshly for bringing forward the referendum, not for the good of the country, but to resolve the increasing deep and bitter schism within the Tory party. Uh, and I believe that he, he will, um, his reputation as prime minister and as a politician will be tarnished by it. And of course, he failed in what he was trying to do. The issue of Europe will now dominate our agenda for years ahead. The problems that were exaggerated and misrepresented by the Tory, Labour and UKIP leavers will be a long time in discussion. Some may never get resolved to the satisfaction of the many who voted for leave for some of those core issues that we all know about. What I think is clear is that we are now living through a sort of false period of peace until the British government has, or the, the Conservative Party has sorted out its new prime minister, uh, leader and prime minister, and until that new prime minister activates the exit button uh, with Chapter 50 of the European Union Treaty. But there are enough indicators already in our economy and in our life of what is to come when that happens, I think, to frighten all of us. We could see the disintegration of the United Kingdom if Scotland carries out its proposals for a second independence referendum. And if I can say, I think... Um, Nicola Sturgeon has played a blinder since the referendum. She has been extremely astute. She's capitalised on the chaos at Westminster. She's shown leadership. She's gone to Brussels. She didn't mind that she was refused to be seen by Mr Donald Tusk. She's seen everyone she could see. She was out there about giving a strong, powerful message for Scotland. And I, uh, I really admired her for the, for the work she did over the last year, even if I don't necessarily agree with her politics and certainly would not like to see Scotland leaving the United Kingdom, but I think it's much closer than it was. We can envisage a collapse of the, party, of the party political system that we've known and loved for generations unless the Labour Party moves quickly to restore stable and progressive leadership for the good of the country. Probably most terrifying for me personally, I must say, is when I look at the analysis of the referendum results and see the divisions in our society that are now exposed. Old and young, rich and poor, graduates and non-graduates, middle and working class, geographic, geographic differences. I think it's very, very scary. And I think we could, if we're not careful, see uh, a right-wing government for decades in the United Kingdom should particularly UKIP hold on to the working class votes that they won at this referendum and even, dare I say it, become the formal opposition at Westminster. And we can't, if the Labour Party isn't quick to sort out its problems, uh, then there is every chance uh, that they may be. What then, then, if that happens, for the rights and benefits that have been fought for by generations of Labour and cooperative activists? What then for the tolerance on our streets, um, of which we've been so proud and have uh, lauded uh, ourselves everywhere uh, over many, many generations. I find myself, as a long-standing member of both the Labour and the Cooperative Party, I find myself fervently hoping that Theresa May becomes the Cooperative Leader and Prime Minister because the alternatives are frankly uh, too awful, except with the exception perhaps of... 
What did I say? Conservative, sorry. Conservative. Thank you. Uh, conservative. Uh, except perhaps for Stephen Crabb, who, uh, who, who looks you know, pretty similar to... That's what happens when you don't follow your script, but start... Anyway, so cooperatives and the state. Which state, what state are we talking about right now? It's a very difficult moment in which to define uh, how we as a cooperative movement go forward with it. So just let me tell you about how I came to know about the Rochdale pioneers. I'm one of, as you already know, of the immediate post-war generation. And I'm one of those fortunate people, and I don't know if there are others in the room, who actually learnt about the Rochdale pioneers at primary school. And I can still remember the teacher in an army school in Germany who taught us about the Rochdale pioneers. And now that is an am amazing, because these days you don't get it anywhere in the educational. Well, you are now through cooperative schools, thank goodness. But, but we haven't had uh, forever. Uh, and I still remember about the Rochdale pioneers. Must have been a cracking teacher, because the story she told stuck in my mind. Uh, and I have a great belief in the value of cooperatives in the community and the role they play as part of the real economy. I have fervently believe uh, that cooperatives uh, are a better form of doing business. Um, and, you know, when I was uh, president of the International Cooperative Alliance, it was my great privilege to be president during the International Year of Cooperatives. And I was invited by the United Nations, because it was a UN year, I was invited to open uh, at the General Assembly, uh, I was invited to open the year on behalf of the movement. Now, for somebody like me, who grew up with the United Nations and who watched, you know, Nikita Khrushchev hitting the table with his chair in the UN and uh, Yasser Arafat and all these, all these, and uh, Nelson Mandela, all these people to speak at the, uh, at the, um, at the General Assembly, uh, at the podium of the General Assembly in front of the assembled governments was an incredible honor. Um, and so, uh, uh, we have been warned, actually, don't give it too much of a hype, because these years, you know, nobody really supports them. Mm -hmm. And um, only two or three governments will speak. It'll all be over in half an hour. So uh, we had 300 cooperators in the, in, the, uh, uh, in, in the public part of the General Assembly uh, room. Um, the Assistant General Secretary spoke, I spoke, and 60 governments from around the world stood up and spoke. It took three hours. Why? Because for those governments, they know only too well that cooperatives are a huge part of the real economy right across the world. And many of them wanted to get up because they'd been pressed by their own cooperative movement to do so. And they knew that the cooperative movement was important to their domestic economies. And as far as Europe is concerned, the EU had an agreement with all its member states, you don't sign these international years, you don't support them. Every one of them signed for the International Year of Cooperatives. Never happened before. And we were thrilled and delighted. Many of the EU governments stood up to speak. So um, the essence of our relationship with states is that we are a, a huge part of many domestic economies, and it cannot be ignored. It can be ignored at international level because we don't appear on the radar of politicians when they sit down to talk about the economy. Because the reference, the reference point, the business reference point for most politicians at that level is uh, the international or are the international uh, stock markets. And we don't appear there. So, so we're invisible to them. But when they come to think about their domestic economies, cooperatives are part of that. So the discussion in New York was very, very important in setting the scene that we did have something, we did have a, a year in which the doors were opened and we could begin to talk to governments in a different way about cooperatives. And everything since then has proved to me that we have everything to play for in building the cooperative family of businesses. When I first became president of the International Alliance, it was uh, after a serious discussion uh, lasting four or five years within the International Cooperative Alliance about whether the movement needed a global body. 
Why did we need it? Because what it had done for decades had been sort of like a centre of information and best practice. It had met three times, four times a year in some part of the world. Nothing happened in between. That in itself had been very valuable as the movement spread around the world. And don't forget, we're talking about a movement that's made up and owned by a billion of the world's citizens. And the largest 300 cooperatives are worth... I've forgotten the figure now. Ed, what's the latest figure? Okay. It shows I haven't, I've been retired since November. Mm -hmm. I think it's, what is it, two? Trillion. Over two trillion. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I was about to say three, and I'm sure you would have raised your eyebrows at me. Yes, 2.3 trillion. That's it. That's it. Um, uh, and so we're talking about a very large movement across the world, owned by a billion, and, and employing over a quarter, 250 uh, 250 million people, giving livelihoods to 250 million people around the world. So it's a huge movement, really reaching out into every corner of the world. But did we need a global body to represent us? One that was simply not doing anything in the global market, was simply meeting, going away again, and then meeting a bit later. So the aim was, uh, and our intention was, and our result was, that if we didn't have a global movement, we would have to invent one. Because in a global market, you need a global representative body. So we, were, we set out to change the ICA. And I was elected, and the board that was elected with me uh, in Geneva in 2009, set out to make a difference and to change the ICA. Uh, I saw my role as building our strength and cohesion so that our form of business and the social and environmental impact that comes as a wider package of our movement could be more, more positively and actively profiled around the world. So we could break out through this, this veneer of invisibility that we had and start to make waves in the global institution. Let's be frank, there are some problems in some parts of the world in the relationship between cooperatives and the state, particularly but not only in Africa with regard to government interference. In many African states, uh, governments have used the cooperative movement. They've used it in the sense that uh, they like to control it, they want to appoint their friends to the cooperative movement. Of course, if it grows, then, then there's uh, finances available. Um, and they also use them to in, in, encourage, um, encourage um, uh, uh, vote people to vote for particular parties. Uh, that's not only in Africa, but, but it is, has been a particular problem throughout the last few decades in Africa. Um, uh, but there are some positive signs now in Africa. Rwanda, Ethiopia, Kenya, all of those countries are now beginning to, uh, to, to develop a much more independent movement. Um, in Rwanda in particular, there were some very encouraging signs of government producing seed corn funding and supporting the growth of cooperatives and then retreating from the cooperatives once it was up and running and democratically working under its own, under its own steam. So that, uh, there are now uh, positive signals coming from, from, um, from Africa. Um, and, you know, I heard in the United Nations a very, very powerful African... Um, cooperator, Professor Suleiman Chambo, when he was reporting to the impact uh, on, uh, on um, Tanzania, his country, of uh, cooperatives. And he said, and I quote, as far as market development is concerned, it's been evident that agricultural cooperatives have been responsible for introducing the exchange economy in remote rural areas in Africa. By doing so, Cooperatives have been responsible for developing modern markets in rural areas where the cooperatives provide a ready market for farmers' crops, but also absorb transaction costs, which would otherwise hinder small farmers from market and production integration. He went on to say, agricultural cooperatives maintain higher levels of income, making small farmers able to construct decent houses, send their children to school, and provide health insurance to sustain rural livelihoods. They also have the advantage of accessing cooperative education and business development capacity building. Cooperative education enables them to participate in democratic debates and exercising democratic principles and leadership training. This gives them the ability to become enlightened citizens, able to debate more effectively different political issues of concern to the community. But through cooperative education and practice, 
they also gain the skills of running business. That is why rural development would be greatly enhanced if people became members of agricultural cooperatives in general. How often I've actually thought of those words in the last week as I've listened to the quite woeful level of debate around the referendum. Why have we allowed the British public to become so ill-informed, so gullible in one sense, so open to manipulation by those with a platform and an overweening ambition? So back to the movement, the strengths of our movement are being recognised by the global institutions. It is slow, hard, frustratingly slow work, but there is progress. During the six years of my presidency of the ICA, we saw a discussion uh, with the World Bank, uh, with the United Nations in detail, with the International uh, Monetary Fund, uh, and latterly with the G20, the body that decides the direction of the global economy, um, which is uh, um, supported by uh, a, a large committee of multinational businesses, which contained not a single cooperative. And we campaigned three years to get cooperatives onto that body. And don't forget, you're talking about the big businesses, the Amazons, uh, the Microsofts, the Nikes. Should we have bothered? I believe we should. Uh, because our movement is global. And with the support of the Australian government, we were able to put the CEO of the largest cooperative in Australia onto the G20 task force uh, and pull together at global level uh, uh, what we called our leadership circle. That's leading cooperators from large cooperatives in different sectors of the economy, agriculture, banking, insurance, consumer, health, housing and so on, put them together as his reference point. So he, sitting there as a, the largest agricultural co-op in Australia, had this reference group of cooperators around the world to whom he could ask on a, on a trade issue, on a banking issue, on an insurance issue and so forth. So we gave him his global movement and he was able to make sure, with the support of the Australian government, that we put in some sensible, clearly articulated evidenced information that showed what cooperatives could do uh, in the economy. And from then, we went on to the, to the um, Turkish presidency and are now active uh, in the Chinese presidency of the G20 with strong support from our Chinese uh, cooperative colleagues. So it is happening. Externally, we are beginning to hit some buttons. Uh, and, and of course, for me personally, one of the, the most unexpected areas was uh, to be invited to the Vatican, as many of you already know, to go and talk uh, to Pope Francis about what cooperatives were doing uh, to, uh, uh, to end poverty in the world. And this, this man who, you know, uh, I'd never been to see a Pope before. Um, <laughs> you don't, do you? I mean, and, uh, and although I, my mother's Maltese and I was baptised as a Catholic or christened as a Catholic, I'm not a practising Catholic. In fact, I'm not really a believer at all, that's the truth. Um, but I was invited to lead a cooperative delegation to the Vatican and we were shown into the hotel where the Pope stays because he doesn't live in the papal apartments in the Vatican. There's, you know, I mean, there must be a reason. Um, but he lives in a hotel where other people are. And um, we waited in this basement lounge, looking at everything, walking around, looking at the pictures. And, and, and this little man walked in, all dressed in white, with his Dr. Martin boots on. And uh, he came up and he said, hello, I'm Pope Francis. Come and sit down and talk to me about how cooperatives can help us end poverty in the world. And we had 50 minutes six of us, just talking to him. No notes, he had no notes, he had nothing. Just himself, no staff with him, and we talked to him. Uh, and he then wrote to the G20, talking about the need to put the human being back in the global economy. And he told us that his father, when he was a little boy, his father had collected him and his brothers, sat them down and talked to him about cooperatives, and that he had never forgotten that. So uh, he's now got a bit of a reputation as the co-op pope around the world. I've seen articles referring to him as that. Um, but support came from the strangest places. Um, so the strengths of the movement are being recognised, and the movement now is more cohesive internally than ever in its history around the world. Um, I've already told you about the leadership circle and what that's able to do for our representative on the G20. But that brings together 15 of the largest cooperatives in the world, largest and most successful, not only commercially,
but those who have uh, the strongest proven record, track record, of promoting cooperative, uh, the cooperative model of business. Then we have a cooperative round table, which is 100 primary cooperatives at national level. Uh, so far we are up to 50, but 100, uh, building to 100. And their, uh, their role is to input information and intelligence about what is happening on the ground, what they think the cooperative movement needs to do, and how the ICA can help that from the global level. And next week, 50 of those 50 will be meeting uh, at, Mid at Mid Counties Cooperative in uh, Warwick um, to talk about uh, to talk about cooperatives and what they do next. That organisation, the, the leadership, the round table, the cooperative round table, those CEOs have actually initiated a global marketing campaign, which is what the video was about, um, and we're going to put it on in a minute. Um, but this global marketing campaign is in recognition that they, the CEOs, believe what we need to do is have a public awareness campaign around the world. Not amongst, because cooperatives are so damnably good at talking to each other, but we are hopeless at talking outside to others. So they want us to talk to outside to others. So an American cooperative offered their services to put together uh, a, YouTube, a, a video for YouTube Firstly, an American one, using American images. They've set up a template, um, and, um, and uh, they then offered it to everybody else who wants to use it, and they have customized it so that it's very easy for everybody. You use the same video template, the same format, but customize images to their own country, the same words in different languages, the same music, and it's now spreading around the world. We launched it. I was really proud to be able to launch what we call the What If video um, uh, in T Turkey, uh, in Antalya, when I retired from, as president. It was the last thing uh, that I did was to launch the, the What If campaign. It's now growing, and Mid Counties has um, launched theirs, and we're going to show it to you. It's, it's being shown now on television in... Central West. Central West and Thames North, in those areas, I think that's right. Ed, you know about it as well. Do you want to, do you want to just say? It's in the, in the George Coronation Street, not the gap there. It's in the, I think you have to be in the right region. Yeah. yeah. It would be great to do it nationally, but it's money. Mm. Uh, but I thought you might like to see it, so how do we put it? So this is now, we launched it in the, the US version, a Hindi version done by our Indian colleagues, a Japanese version, uh, and a Spanish version from, version from Argentina. And some of the images were very, very powerful. The Japanese cooperatives during the tsunami and the, and the earthquake in, in Japan. Indian cooperatives and what they're doing for communities right across India. Um, so very powerful stuff, and, and all using exactly that format, all using exactly the same words with just their own images. 
uh, and they will be meeting this year to this, this next week, and I'm going to have dinner with them, um, to uh, see how they move it forward. So I should be pleased to meet up with those people who are leading that. Uh, and I think within two weeks of the US one going on YouTube, it had 50,000 hits. So it was a very powerful uh, message, and we hope it's going to spread around the world. So when the movement is now coming together, not just to talk to, to ourselves, but to talk to the public. So this is a crucial moment in the history of our state, but not only our state. We've all seen and heard the wider disaffection in many parts of Europe, not just with the European Union, but with their national political elites. The Nordic countries, for the first time, feeling the serious threats from far-right parties. Germany, France, the Netherlands. The different political revolutions in Greece and Spain on the back of their economic crisis and evidence of political elite scandals and greed. And then, of course, there's Donald Trump. <laughs> Donald Trump piling up support on the back of exactly that same disaffection and dislocation in communities, a sense of injustice, unfairness, and an increasing anger that probably is the most threatening thing of all. And you know, um, everybody in the US is saying that this is the election with the worst two candidates ever. And the danger of that, and a Hillary Clinton, obviously I guess most of us would want Hillary Clinton to win, but I have some anxieties about it. Well, I have some anxieties about Hillary Clinton and, and, and some of her, but I would far rather she won than Donald Trump, believe me. Um, but what we're all experiencing is the result of the degeneration of politics on the back of the ascendancy of capitalist businesses and the primacy of the profit motive. And there is a space and an opportunity for something different. And this is the time for cooperatives to advocate for our role in building better communities, in our ability to bring cohesion, fairness, equality, and make it possible for everyone to participate and engage in building a better world. The movement can show the way. Someone, somehow, has to express a different view, promote a different vision of the life chances and how they can be developed and grow in the 21st century global economy, because that's not going to go away, and how we can make it work for local people in local communities. It ought to be us, and it ought to be now. Only by working together, though, uh, can we actually bring that vision to life. Only by ensuring that all cooperatives walk the talk and are actually real and true and legitimate cooperatives can we prove our way of doing business is a better one and prove its benefits for local people and our local communities. It has to be now, it has to be public, and it has to be genuine if we are together to prove that there is an alternative to the collapse of local communities the disaffection of local people, and the rise of those who would try to manipulate those anxieties and concerns for their own vested interests and singular political motives. It can be done. We can build a new cooperative relationship with the state. And why not here? Why not first in the United Kingdom where cooperative was given to the world? Thank you very much.